three lies your kids would want to believe. We live in a society where most people don't seem to find reasons to substantiate their faith and when they see the fun outside, they sit home as Christians and think they are missing out on a lot. And when those thoughts set in, they see school, leaving home to college as their way out. Now, this is a video by Dr. Frank Turek, one of the top most scholars when it comes to biblical apologetics. And I would like us to watch this video. If you are a parent watching me, I know by the time we are done with this video, you would, you would find some reason to know that in all that is going on, God is still in the process. Okay, we'll get more into it. You can leave your issues in the comment sections and we'll pray for you. Let's get into our video for today. This guy wasn't writing me as a tough guy. He was actually writing me as a distraught father. He said, my daughter was the top Christian student in her high school class. She led several youth groups. She won several scholarships from Christian organizations to go to college. She could take him to any college she wanted to. And so my daughter, this man said, wanted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to win the campus for Christ, and it needs to be one for Christ. In any event, he said, four weeks into her first semester, I got a phone call from her, and her words devastated me. She said, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. Don't believe in God anymore? What? He said, I got in my car, I drove four hours down to Chapel Hill that weekend, I sat down with her, and I got nowhere with her. What do you mean you don't believe in God anymore? What happened? And she said, well, you know, we have this atheist professor who teaches the New Testament class. And um, he said, we don't even know who wrote the Gospels and the Bible has errors in it. So, Dad, I'm an atheist now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you think that this young girl, by the way, that's not her. Um, <laughs> do you think that this young girl in four weeks investigated all the evidence for and against Christianity and made a rational decision it was false? No, you probably couldn't even do that in four weeks. What happened instead? What happened is she had gone off to the college unarmed. Most people born Christians today aren't given reasons that substantiate their faith. They go to church all right, they do everything, but they do not know God. They do not know what it means for Jesus to be referred to as the son of God. They have no idea what born again means. They do not know anything about salvation. They know nothing. All they know is we were born as Christians and so we've been going to church our entire lives. There is this biblical passage which is a parable in the Bible and it speaks concerning a guy who lived with his father, happily had everything that he wanted, but then when I read that passage, what I picked from it was a guy who sat home and felt he was missing out on the fun going on in the world. Most people go to church today, sleep the entire service, and then come back home. They have no idea why they are Christians. They have no idea what a Christian must do. They do not have. They aren't being taught. You enter into most Pentecost Methodists. The church is drying out. Seems it's drying out right in certain areas like in europe america seems like it's drying out but the church is actually growing in certain parts of the world but i would like to use europe and america and some parts of africa as an as examples where the pews seem to be emptying and nobody seems to care in fact when the youth come into churches they are being chastised for how they are dressed how they are nobody is into teaching them the precepts of god it's all about don't do this, don't do that. Don't, the youth do not know why they shouldn't do that. They are not being given reasons why they shouldn't do that. And the youth today see school, college as a safe heaven where they would run and hide and then do whatever that they want to do that they couldn't do at home. They couldn't do it at home because they were prevented from doing it without any reason. She didn't know why Christianity was true. And as soon as she heard what seemed to be reasons it wasn't true, 
she decided she was just going to walk out on Christianity. And why wouldn't you? When you go to college, you don't want to do everything your parents said. You don't want to have the perceived moral restraints of Christianity on you. You want to do your own thing. Which is one reason why we go to colleges through our ministry and we present evidence that Christianity is true. It's from a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And we always set up a microphone for Q&A. Here is a picture from an event we had at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California berserkly does. <laughs> and um, whenever an unbeliever gets up to the microphone and express any, any, expresses any hostility at all, I'll normally stop and ask the unbeliever a question. And I recommend you ask unbelievers this question. Here's the question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no. No. Wait, I thought you claimed to be reasonable. I thought you claimed to be rational. How is it reasonable you wouldn't believe something that was true? Well, it has nothing to do with reason. It's not a head problem. It's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God over their own lives. They're not on a truth quest or on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. Now, here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun, but ultimately selfish and, and sinful things. Yet, over the long term, it's a disaster. Amen. And everyone in this room over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves, right? If you want contentment, you got to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. But a lot of people want to try it themselves. Look, ladies and gentlemen, if you just live for yourself all the time, if you just become a me monster and it's all about you all the time, how long are your relationships going to last? Who's going to put up with that? And if somebody does, you're probably not going to have a very fruitful relationship. No, you live for you all the time. You're ultimately going to wind up divorced, addicted, broken, alone, and probably prematurely dead. You can't just follow your whims or your desires all the time. And we're going to get into it a little bit today because there are a lot of lies out there that your kids want to believe. In fact, we're going to talk about three lies that your kids want to believe. And this is especially appropriate on Father's Day because as we'll see at the end of this, fathers have a disproportionate amount of influence over what their kids believe and do. Now, let me preface this by saying, I'm not saying that just because you teach your kids the truth about Christianity that they're necessarily going to wind up to be Christians. They still might walk away. But I will say this, though. It's much harder to walk away from something that you know beyond a reasonable doubt is true. It's easy to walk away from something you've doubted your whole life. And by the way, it's really hard for the heart to rejoice in what the mind doubts. So you ought to have evidence for what you believe. The scriptures tell us this and common sense tells us we ought to have evidence for what we believe. So what I want to do is give you some evidence. And by the way, these three lies that kids want to believe today, the reason kids want to believe them is because if they believe them, they're going to be in control of their lives. They think so anyway. And they're going to be really popular if they believe these things. The first lie that young people want to believe, and probably some older people too, is that I have my own truth. I can live however way I want because I'm the arbiter of truth. I'm the standard of truth. And this really is what has been the dominant philosophy in our culture. It's called postmodernism or relativism. And it's basically the view that there is no truth. Relativism is something that I find very amusing because people tend not to be able to leave that out. Now, this is what the Bible speaks concerning truth. Romans 12, 2. And be ye not conformed to the things of this world. And it continues. Now, that word conformed in Greek is suskematizo, which is to bend your entire being to suit an ideology which isn't biblical or God-like. And this is what Christians are taught. This is what God demands of people who claim to take the Bible as an authority or have God as their objective uh, 
moral arbitrator. And so if we are going to be people of faith, then it is demanded of us biblically and from that God perspective that we stand for the truth and not bend. The moment we bend, we are becoming lukewarm. And our faith we claim we have isn't truly so. And today people go into schools and they tend to follow some of these ideologies because they want to sound cool, they want to be accepted, and they want to be culturally and politically correct. Now, what I'm about to talk about in the next few minutes, I think is the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And to show you what a dimwit I was, I was 33 years old, I already had a master's degree, and I did not know what I'm about to tell you right now, this thinking skill, which is extremely important. And why didn't I know it? Because I never had a course in logic. How many people in here have ever, have ever had a course in logic? Can I see your hands, please? All right, see these people with their hands up? These are the homeschoolers. See them? There they are. We don't teach logic in public school anymore. We should. Instead of teaching kids how to think, we're teaching them what to feel. And that's dangerous because if you live your life by feelings without reason, you're going to wind up in a very dark place. Yes, emotion makes life fun, but logic makes life safe. And what we're going to talk about here is something called the law of non-contradiction. It's a fundamental law of logic. You all intuitively know it, but you may have forgotten you've known it. It goes like this. Opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. For example, we can't both be at Chino Hills and not at Chino Hills at the same time and in the same sense, right? It's one or the other. God can't both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same sense. It's one or the other. You with me? What we're going to do is apply this law of logic to some of the statements we hear in our culture today that support relativism and postmodernism, like this one. There is no truth. If someone were to say to you, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Yeah, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. All right, now this is said in different ways in our culture. Sometimes it's said this way, all truth is relative. If somebody says all truth is relative, if you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask back? You guys are sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. Come on. <laughs> if somebody says all truth is relative, it, it's always a question. You're going to ask, is that, is that a relative truth? No, that's an absolute truth. Can everyone see that's an absolute truth claiming all truth is relative? It defeats itself. Now, in our culture, it's more often said this way. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth, you live your truth, I'll have my truth, we'll all get along. I mean, this sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? <laughs> There's just one problem with it. It's logically self-defeating. Because if somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, you simply ask them, is that just your truth or the truth? In other words, is the statement on top just your truth? If it is, why should I believe it? You know, it's just your opinion, so why should I believe it? But if you're saying the statement on top is the truth, can everyone see the first half of that statement says there aren't any the truths? Can everyone see this is a the truth statement claiming there are no such thing as the truth statements? This defeats itself. Now, I know it's very unpopular to say this, but I have to say it anyway. There's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. I mean, if you want to say you have your own truth, you might as well say, I... well, thank you. Five people go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, that's just true for you over there. <laughs> now, sometimes it's said this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Well, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism's true for me. What do you say to that? This is also self-defeating. It's just a little bit more subtle. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, you need to ask, hey, is that true for everybody? Is true for you but not for me true for everybody? Because if true for you but not for me is true for everybody, then true for you but not for me can't be true because it's true for everybody. <laughs> Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. 
But that's because it's self-defeating. It violates the law of non-contradiction. It's doing exactly what it says can't be done. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you but not for me, say, sure, try that the next time you get pulled over. <laughs> Let's say you're going down Highway 5. You're going 100 miles an hour. Cop sees you, pulls you over, walks up to the car, knocks on the window. You put the glass down. He says, you were going 100. It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply say, ha, that's true for you but not for me. And you speed away. <laughs> you can't give a ticket if it's not true for you. No, if it's true you're going 100, that's true for all people at all times and all places when referring to you at that time. It's just true. By the way, if it's true Jesus rose from the dead, that's true for all people at all times and all places, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, if he didn't rise from the dead, that's true as well, even if you believe it. Truth doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you believe. Facts don't care about your feelings. Okay, so from here, he is going to give a couple of examples and certain facts and evidence to back his point. And so I would like us to move on to lie number two your kids would want to believe. The second lie your kids want to believe is that love means approval. Why? If well, love means approval, they can approve of everybody, regardless of what they want to do. They don't have to stand for truth at all. It could be all about just acceptance. But that's not love, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, a uh, number of years ago here at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, I did a, a sermon on Does Love Require Approval? I'm just going to summarize it. You can see the entire thing on the Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills website. But let me ask you a question this way. How many parents do we have in the room here? All right, how many former children do we have in the room here? Okay, good. That's all of us then. All right? Question. If your parents approved of everything you wanted to do when you were 13 years old, would they have been loving? No, of course not. Love doesn't mean approval. Love doesn't mean enabling people to do evil. Love means you're standing in the way of evil. If you, don't, if you approve of everything some kid wants to do, you're not loving, you're unloving. You're an enabler. In fact, in the passage that everybody reads at their wedding, but nobody obeys, 1 Corinthians 13... Here's what Paul says about love. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always protects. Love always perseveres. You don't protect people when you're approving of the evil they're doing. You're doing the opposite. Knock it off. There is one other verse here that I love so much. Hebrews 12, 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons now the chastisement here in greek is paideia which is to instruct people on what is right with the aim of them being virtually upright and so we instruct people because we want to see them do good not because we hate them now if ye be without chastisement the ye there signifies that one is a believer and so unbelievers could do whatever that they want to do. But the moment you become a Christian, the Bible requires that you be humble. When I meet people and I share the gospel with them, I, drive, I, I drag them to church. They stay for a while. When I begin to shepherd them, some of the things that I teach them are patience the ability for one to be patient i teach them concerning humility why one has to be humble i teach them on the holy spirit and and who they are in christ they are born again what it meant for them to be born again and then i teach them about how much god loves them and how god wants to see them free of all that they used to be before right christianity isn't god loves you as you are and so come as you are it is God loves you as you are. Come and then God will change you. So God wants to change you, not come and then be as you are and then go to hell. No. Now, still reading, it says, wherefore all are partakers. And so we are all partakers. The moment one becomes born again, now you become partaker. You become a partaker of all heavenly gifts, right? A partaker can't be a bastard. Because now the Bible or God categorizes you as a son. And so if God is willing to categorize you as a son, then he will chastise you so you don't become a bastard. And so God corrects. 
let's not have this ideology where oh god loves us so much god wouldn't want this to happen to us god loves us so much i'm not sure i spoke to one lady who said i'm not sure god wants me to quit this because this gives me a lot of energy and this is how i'm able to roll through the day i'm not sure god wants me to quit this i've spoken to smokers who are like well god i'm not sure this is a big deal god wouldn't be concerned about it god wants to prune you if you study the gospel of john 15 there about speaks of the vineyard god prunes and then you out of obedience and humility you continually be a branch who will bear fruit and so god wants you to bear fruit and that is why he is pruning you else you can't be a blessing to anybody you can't do anything for god and this is what we preach to people today students on college campuses want that kind of love where you do not tell them you they are wrong or you are wrong it is just well we love you no matter who you are do whatever that suits you best that isn't love if i see you going down the gutter and i am not wise or loving enough to tell you that that thing is a gutter and i have to tell you because the children of this world are blind and they live in darkness and so although it's a gutter that leads to hell you wouldn't know that is why i have to tell you that is a gutter that leads to hell and the world doesn't like it like that anymore they simply want to watch want you to watch them go down the gutter which is in so it is not christ-like to see people engage in evil and then you claiming to be a christian sit back and say well if they think it's good then let them do it that is not love in fact jesus who went to the cross for us gave us one new command you know what the one new command is here it is he says a new commandment i give you love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another how did he love us he sacrificed himself for us so what is love for us it means sacrifice it doesn't mean approval do you know when we fail to say what we know to be true because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not really loving people. We're enabling them to do evil. And a lot of times we won't tell them the truth because we don't want them mad at us. And you know why we do that? Because we want to take the easy way. We will sacrifice them for our benefit rather than sacrificing ourselves for their benefit. That's what love is, to sacrifice yourself for the benefit of others. So you need to tell people what the truth is in as tactful a way as possible. Here's one way you could do it. You might say to somebody you love who, say, is wanting to approve of, say, aberrant sexual practices. They're all over now. You might say to them, hey, if I was about to go down a road you knew that would hurt me and hurt others and would be against God's will. Would you love me enough to tell me? What's the other person going to say? Well, of course. Great. Can I do the same for you right now? Love does not mean approval. Thomas Sowell is now 94 years old and says everything well. Put it this way. He said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Okay, so the third lie your kids would want to believe i would leave the link in the description below to the full video so you can go and then watch it but there is this big argument between love and tolerance people preaching love mostly are seeking tolerance now to be tolerant is simply not having not wanting to deal with other people's crap right and so I will tolerate you because I don't really have time to deal with that thing. Tolerance is completely different from love, right? If I love you, I would seek for your betterment. If I'm tolerant, I'll just watch you do it because that is what makes you feel good. And I think most students on college campuses today, that is what they preach instead of love, but they mention love more, which is to say they do not really understand what they are speaking about. And we have to pray for them. If your son for some reason left home and is claiming now not to believe in God, do not panic. Do not actually fear because now fear welcomes in the devil and he operates tightly in there. The devil operates through fear 
And so if you have fear in you, then it's a ticket given to the devil to come work in your life, which shouldn't be so. God is loving and in him there is no fear. The best you can do for now is pray. I would like you to leave your issues there concerning this topic in the comment section below and we would help you pray for them. Do not panic because God is in control. There is nothing too difficult for God. Hey, we've seen worst people in societies come to Christ. If you are a parent, also make sure that you pray for your kids before they go to school so they would be surrounded by godly people who share the same faith as them. Other than that, they might get into college and then the devil will just drive weird people who share different ideologies from what they believe in and by the time you hear from them, they are bowing down to certain statues and stuff which wouldn't be good news. Yeah, if you love this video, kindly don't forget to subscribe, like, share. Until my next video, peace out.